All right, so we have a great set of telescopes, two telescopes that Fraunhofer made. And to get the most out of a good instrument, you need to have a great experimentalist. And it turned out Fraunhofer gave, uh, or you know, his, his telescopes were used by two great early astronomers. And none more important than this astronomer, uh, Bessel. And so Bessel was not just an experimentalist, he was also a mathematician. There's a very famous set of functions, Bessel functions, that uh, he was involved with. I won't say he invented them, but he was involved with their tabulation and things. And so he was able to get the most out of this telescope that he was given. He used to say that every telescope had to be built twice. First of all, it was actually built when it was originally manufactured, but secondly, you had to, when you observe with it, understand every single piece of it and all the things that go wrong. So, for example, whenever it got delivery of a new telescope, he wouldn't start taking serious data for possibly two years. He'd spend two years trying it out, measuring everything that could possibly go wrong, all the systematic errors. Um, so he worked very hard at these telescopes. In this telescope, for example, he had to work out exactly what angle corresponded to shifting the two halves of the front lens. He had to work out how the whole thing would bend depending on gravity. As a temperature change, the screw that controlled the two halves of the mirror would change because of its expansion and contraction. He calibrated all that. In fact, he often spent a lot of his time going to look at other people's data and recalibrating it. He was able to show, for example, that one of his assistants always measured the stopwatch two seconds too late because he looked at how the timing of the different stars, different parts of the sky, and found on one side it was always two seconds off from the other side. So he actually spent a lot of his time going through other people's data for other astronomers and analysing in great detail what we now call data reduction. It's what we both spend a huge amount of our time doing. When you observe, you're only half started. Most of the work is afterwards in trying to find all these possible systematic errors and weeding them out and fixing them. So this is exactly you know, what uh, a, sci a modern scientist of the day would uh, use. And he only spent two years working on his telescope. Our own sky mapper, we've had to work six years to get all its issues. And we're continuing as part of my you know, daily work is to go in and try to weed out all those systematic errors in the same way that Bessel really started doing. But when you do it, then you get good quality data. And I can tell you that good quality data uh, no matter how smart you are as a mathematician, you always do better if you have good quality data. And so at long last, he measured um, parallax. He actually was able to see a star wiggling. He didn't trust his own, he, he published his own data. He actually wasn't the first to measure it, but he was the first person to measure it and be believed because he was okay. so careful and precise. It's much like with your discovery of dark energy. There were plenty of other clues before, but you were, uh, the first time it was actually, the data was so good that people actually believed it. When he'd measured it, he thought, I'm not quite sure. So he then closed down the observatory, took the telescope to pieces, rebuilt it again, and then measured it again to make sure it was still there after everything had been rebuilt from scratch. That's being very dedicated. And it was still there, and this was a level of dedication that made him famous and made that he was really believed and he was one of the greatest astronomers of the time, brought great prestige to Prussia back then. So he'd found parallax, but what we're concerned with is another discovery he made a few years later. He was um, out looking for parallax around more stars, and he recognised a picture I took three nights ago. Here's Orion, and up there is the brightest star in the sky, Sirius. And the he decided, dog star, yes. Um, the dog star, um, and he decided to try and look for a wobble in this. And he found a wobble, but not the wobble he expected. A much bigger wobble than he was expecting. And a wobble not with a one-year period as the Earth goes around the Sun, but a 50-year period. Right. And it was, a, it was a very large wobble that was on order of uh, seven arc seconds, which would be, uh, we now know, sort of you know, an order of magnitude more than the parallax measurement of this star. And so you can see Sirius is moving in a nice ellipse. And the reason why uh, stars move in ellipses is typically because they're in orbits around other stars. But in this case, the star isn't very bright. Sirius is very bright, and whatever it's orbiting, uh, not very bright. Yeah, Sirius weighs about twice the mass of the Sun. It's a luminous star. And clearly, I mean, you can tell there must be something maybe, if it's over here, it must be over that way. And so as they go around, they're opposite each other the whole time. So there's something there. It must weigh quite a lot, because it's making Sirius move a lot. It couldn't be a planet. It's got to be much heavier than a planet. But we're not seeing it. So, Paul, you should be able to use that orbital motion and calculate the star that we cannot see. Okay, let's go and do that.